Hello everyone, welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 86th deck and it's titled Nesta's Brew. And the name comes from one of our guinea pigs, which is named after a book character. So if you understand that reference, congrats. Hopefully it makes sense with what we're doing and especially makes sense once you see our random card of the week. But if you haven't seen this show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So very quickly, before we get into the actual deck tech, I want to take a second, highlight some of our social media accounts. If you're interested, you can follow us over on Twitter, find us on Reddit, send us an email at 13POYNZ, u slash POYNZ13, or dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. Those are all great ways to reach out to us if you ever have any questions, want to talk about some of the decks, make suggestions, or just have a conversation. If you're looking to support the channel, though, you can always just like the video, subscribe to the channel. That does help out a lot. But if you want to help a little bit more directly, you can go on over to TCG Player using our affiliate link in the description below. Any cards you purchase after clicking on that link lets TCG Player know that we sent you over there, so we get a little bit of a kickback from that. And of course, the most direct way you can help support us patreon.com slash dungeon learners guide there you get access to our deck techs an entire week early you get access to a discord channel where we brew up some of the decks and also play the games so if you've ever been interested in playing games on the channel that is a great way to participate and of course at the top tier you would also get access to the unedited gameplay videos so you can hear the players talking with each other laughing having a good time rather than just my own narration and i will also send you one of our random cards of the week every single month. So if that is something you're interested in, please do check it out. And like I said earlier, if none of that is what you want to be doing, or maybe just not your style, I completely understand. You can always like the video, subscribe to the channel. That is certainly very helpful. So without any more rambling from me, I suppose it's time we jump into the actual deck tech. So first up, we got to start with our random card of the week which this time was suggested to us by miserable level 7966 over on reddit and that card is storm cauldron so once again going back to the title of nesta's brew hopefully if you understand the reference it makes a little bit more sense now and if not well might just have to look it up but storm cauldron is five mana for an artifact that says each player may play an additional land during each of their turns whenever a land is tapped for mana return it to its owner's hand so I'm not going to lie to you. When I first got this suggestion, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. I started looking at different commanders and different color combinations and different themes, and I just I could not figure it out. And then eventually, I found a commander in a color combination that I personally don't play that often, so I wasn't aware that this commander really existed. And the gears just kind of started turning. So the commander that we're going to be working with this week is actually in the Simic colors, and it is Jadzi Oracle of Arcavios. She is 6 blue blue, so a massive 8 mana for a 5-5 five, five human wizard. We can discard a card to return Jadzi Oracle of Arcavios to its owner's hand, and it has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it by paying one rather than paying its mana cost. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield. Now, you might be saying to yourself, but Zach, this doesn't really seem to work that well with Storm Cauldron. Why would we want to return lands to our hand when this isn't technically a landfall commander? And that is why we're also looking at the back of Jadzi, Journey to the Oracle. This is going to be the big key piece of this deck. Journey to the Oracle is two green green for a sorcery that says you may put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Then, if you control eight or more lands, you may discard a card. If you do, return Journey to the Oracle to its owner's hand. This plus Storm Cauldron allows us to make a ton of landfall triggers almost on loop because what we can do is tap all of our lands with storm cauldron in play they all return to our hand then we cast journey to the oracle put them all back into play and as long as we had eight or more we can then discard a card return journey to the oracle to our hand and do it again so if we have more than eight lands we are now in the process of gaining mana every time we do it 
And if we have anything in play that cares about lands entering the battlefield, we are getting a ton of triggers every single time it comes in. So that is the synergy that we are trying to build this entire deck around. So without any further ado, let's talk about some of the themes of this deck. How are we actually going to make that synergy relevant and hopefully get us to the point where we can win the game? So first up, like I've kind of already mentioned, we have landfall synergies. If we can have eight lands enter the battlefield, come back to our hand, enter the battlefield again, come back to our hand, maybe enter the battlefield a third time, at that point, we're looking at about 24 landfall triggers. If we have something like Lotus Cobra in play, which is one in a green for a 2-1 snake, landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, add one mana of any color. That sequence now gives us 24 mana of any combination of colors. That's going to pretty much allow us to cast the rest of our hand, or if we have some way of getting more cards, casting pretty much our entire deck. We're going to be able to keep churning through landfall triggers, keep churning through cards, and be able to take absolutely massive chunks of landfall triggers all at once. So we're not aiming to get like one or two a turn. We're aiming to get like 10 plus landfall triggers every single turn. That is the main theme of this deck. Now, to back up that theme, we've got to make sure that we have Storm Cauldron. That is a tricky thing to do because we are in Simic. There's not a ton of tutor effects in Simic, so we are relying on cards like War of Invention, which is X, blue, blue, blue for an instant. It has Improvise. We don't have a ton of artifacts, so that's not going to be super relevant. But it says, search your library for an artifact card with converted mana cost X or less, Put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So, yes, it is very expensive. This is a massive 8 mana, but we can do it at instant speed, which is a massive improvement from other tutors, and we put it directly into the battlefield. So we can make sure that at the end of our opponent's turn, we can go ahead, immediately get Storm Cauldron, put it into play, and then on our turn, start doing Lotus Cobra shenanigans or anything else that we want to be doing. So War of Invention... And all of our other tutors that specifically grab artifacts are incredibly relevant for what we're trying to do with the deck. Because if we don't have Storm Cauldron, then we're just kind of a generic landfall deck. And we're not going to have the power to back it up in the way that we will when we have Storm Cauldron. So it's very important to us that we have Storm Cauldron in play when we try to go off with the deck. And finally, that leads us to our last theme of the deck, and that is going to be Ramp. Since Journey to the Oracle requires us to have eight lands in play, we need to make sure that we actually get eight lands in play. It also helps us cast the War of Invention to get Storm Cauldron, because that's going to be eight mana. It helps us cast Jadzi if we need to, because she's eight mana. So we have cards like Migration Path, which is three and a green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. It also has Cycling for two. So it's basically Explosive Vegetation, but better. So Migration Path, very good card, helps us get lands when we need it, and it pumps us all the way up from 4 mana to 6, which is an incredible jump for this deck because most of what we want to be doing costs 5 plus mana because of how powerful it's going to be with landfall synergies. Plus, Migration Path puts two lands into play at one time, meaning we can trigger something like Lotus Cobra, get some mana, and keep going off with the deck. So... Those are the major themes of the deck, but of course, we do also have to talk about some key cards. The cards that, while not the main combo piece, because obviously that's Storm Cauldron, they're still cards that work very well in the deck and push us toward that victory in the long run. So first up, we have Archmage Emeritus, which is two blue blue for a human wizard, 2-2, two, two. has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card. Now... We're not spell slinger, so this isn't going to be super relevant for us just like storming off on our turn and drawing a bunch of cards. But where this is relevant is because when we cast Journey to the Oracle, we can't put it back into our hand unless we discard a card, which means we need to make sure that every time we cast Journey to the Oracle, we are drawing a card. Archmage Emeritus lets us draw that card. So if we can have eight plus lands, Storm Cauldron, Journey to the Oracle, which is in the command zone, so we'll always have that, and Archmage Emeritus, we can draw our entire deck and make as many landfall triggers as we want. Now, 
It is very relevant, though, to note that Archmage Emeritus is not a May trigger. It says whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card. So if we get to the point where we have drawn our entire deck, we can no longer cast instants and sorceries, or we'll just try to draw a card and lose the game. So that is very relevant. Don't accidentally knock yourself out of the game with Archmage Emeritus, but it will let you churn through your entire deck with the combo that we've talked about. Then... That leads us to our second key card, which is Tireless Provisioner. So in a similar vein to Archmage Emeritus, in which case we want to be drawing cards, Tireless Provisioner is going to be giving us a life, and it's going to be giving us mana. Because Tireless Provisioner, 2 and a green for a 3-2 Elf Scout, Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, create a food token or a treasure token. So all we have to do is say we have our eight lands, we bounce them back to our hand, we cast Journey to the Oracle, we put them all into play, we get eight landfall triggers from Tireless Provisioner. That means we could make eight food tokens, we could make eight treasure tokens, or any combination of the two. If we're making treasure tokens, we have effectively now doubled our mana just by having Tireless Provisioner in play because we go from eight lands to eight lands plus eight treasures. So that really helps push us above and beyond. And while Lotus Cobra is great and it also does get us mana, treasures stick around. We don't have to use the mana right now or risk losing it. We could always make a ton of treasures, go to combat, maybe even pass the turn, and still have that mana available if we need it. So that is why I think Tireless Provisioner is leaps and bounds ahead of Lotus Cobra, even though it does cost one more mana. Now, finally, we get to our last key card of the deck, and that is Ruin Crab. Ruin Crab and its buddy Hedron Crab, which we'll worry about later because it's not, as weird as it is, not quite as powerful as Ruin Crab in this deck. Because Ruin Crab is the win condition. It is one blue mana for a 0-3 crab, and it has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills three cards. So if we have the combo that we've talked about, Storm Cauldron, Journey to the Oracle, and, well, eight lands, all we've got to do, we tap our eight lands, we bounce them back to our hand, we recast Journey to the Oracle, put our eight lands into play, and there are now eight Ruin Crab triggers on the stack. That means each opponent is going to mill three eight times. And that is an incredibly powerful thing to do, because if we're doing that, then all of a sudden... Our opponents aren't going to have a library. They're only going to be able to survive a couple of those instances of landfall without milling out their entire decks. And if we're in the process of having something like Archmage Emeritus, where we're drawing cards so we can keep doing this combo, then our opponents just can't win. Unless, of course, they have some way to shuffle their graveyard back in, in which case we need to do something else. But this will mill out their entire deck with out even drawing our entire deck. So there's very little room for them to kind of get around this. If they do, of course, we have some backups in the deck, but if we can go Ruin Crab into some ramp into Archmage Emeritus and then just start doing the combo, then there's not much our opponents could do. But those are our key cards for the week. And next thing we got to do is talk a little bit about some cards that synergize very well, some cool interactions. And in this deck, there's actually a lot of cool interactions, so I really had to kind of narrow it down to just a few. But these are a couple of interactions that I think are a little bit more corner case and also a little bit more relevant for this deck in particular. So the first of those cool interactions is going to be Risen Reef and Zendikar's Royal. Because we are making a ton of land drops in one go, this combination, which is always very good, mind you, you should probably be playing this combination if you get the chance, these two combined with eight landfall triggers at once is absolutely insane. Risen Reef, one green blue for a 1-1 elemental. Whenever Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, put it into your hand. So we can combine that up with Zendikar's Royal, which is three green green for an enchantment. Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, create a two two green elemental creature token. So you may already see where this is going, but if we have Risen Reef and Zendikar's Royal in play, we play a land. That triggers the landfall on Zendikar's Royal, makes an elemental, which triggers Risen Reef, 
and that has us look at the top card of our deck, and if that top card is a land, the land goes directly into play, which triggers Zendikar's Royal, which makes another Elemental, which triggers Risen Reef again, and we can do that as many times as we want for as many lands are on top of our deck. And even if we don't hit a land with Risen Reef, we still draw that card, we still put it into our hand. So if we get eight landfall triggers all at once, we make eight Elementals all at once, we get eight Risen Reef triggers all at once, and then any lands in our top eight cards continue the process and keep making elementals and keep making land drops and keep drawing cards. So all we've got to do is trigger landfall with Journey to the Oracle two or three times, and we have almost an unstoppable army of elementals. And unfortunately, because we are in Simic, there's not a ton of great ways to give haste, particularly on a budget. So you might just have to pass and hope that there's no board wipes but this is also something that if you can somehow manage to trigger this at instant speed you could do this at the end of an opponent's turn and then untap with all those elementals and hopefully win the game from there so that is cool interaction number one cool interaction number two also obviously going to be dealing with landfall but is going to look a little bit different and this one is going to be kodama of the east tree and rampaging baloths so Kodama of the East Tree, 4 green green for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature spirit. It's got reach. Whenever another permanent enters the battlefield under your control, if it wasn't put onto the battlefield with this ability, you may put a permanent card with equal or lesser converted mana cost from your hand onto the battlefield. And then it has partner, which is irrelevant for us in this deck. But if we partner that up with Rampaging Baloths, which is also 4 green green, also for a 6-6 six, six creature, this time beast, trample, and landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may create a 4-4 green beast creature token. Now the way that these two cards work together is if we happen to have, say, five lands in our hand, which is pretty unlikely but not impossible, we've got five lands in our hand, all we have to do is play one land, that triggers Rampaging Baloths to make a 4-4 beast token, then Kodama sees a zero mana permanent enter the battlefield. That Baloth enters the battlefield, triggers Kodama. We get to put a zero drop from our hand into play. We can then put another land into play. That triggers the Baloths again, making another beast, triggering Kodama again, putting another land into play. So basically, with these two both in play, we end up putting every single land in our hand into play and making a beast token for every single land that we put into play. So that can be incredibly powerful depending on how many lands we have in our hand. And if they're both in play when we have our Storm Cauldron Journey to the Oracle combo going on, we can continuously do that multiple times for each loop of the combo, making a pretty unstoppable 4-4 beast army and tapping all the lands as we go for a ton of mana. So a great combination, very powerful, but very expensive, six mana each. So something to be aware of. But that brings us to the end of our deck tech, or, well, almost the end. We do have to talk about the budget first. So this week, our budget was $92.93, so pretty close to our budget limit of $100, but not quite there. And a big portion of that is coming from our most expensive card, Fabricate. So... As I mentioned earlier, we need ways to get Storm Cauldron, and Fabricate is a super efficient and cheap way to do that. Fabricate's two and a blue for a sorcery, search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. This just straight up finds us the card, puts it into our hand. Now it is unfortunately almost $7, so a little bit on the expensive side, but if you're looking to cut the price down of the deck to close to like $86, this is a card you can cut. There are replacements you can make to it, none that are nearly as efficient, but still something to consider. If you want the deck to be a little less reliant on the combo, then this is an easy cut to make. On the other hand, though, if you're looking to actually increase the price of the deck, maybe you've got some out-of-budget upgrades you want to include, I do have a suggestion for you there as well. The main card that I'm going to suggest replacing for this deck is going to be Cultivator Colossus, and you can swap out Vexing Puzzle Box for that. So Cultivator Colossus is 4 green 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 for a star star plant beast. It's got trample, and Cultivator Colossus's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. Now, 
a word of warning here that does mean that if you're doing the combo with storm cauldron it will just die when you have no lands so be aware of that before you start going off with the combo however when cultivator colossus enters the battlefield you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped if you do draw a card and repeat this process so this is another great way to get a ton of lands into play and effectively acts as a finisher for our deck once we have that ton of lands in play now, the card that I re recommend taking out, Vexing Puzzle Box, is 3 mana for an artifact. Whenever you roll one or more dice, put a number of charge counters on Vexing Puzzle Box equal to the result. Tap, add a mana of any color, roll a d20, and tap, remove 100 charge counters from Vexing Puzzle Box. Search your library for an artifact card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle. So this card is in here as another way to get Storm Cauldron. However in testing the deck i don't think it's nearly as good as you want it to be because even if you roll that d20 and you get a 20 every single time it's still going to take you five turns to get 100 charge counters and by the time you get close to 100 charge counters your opponents are well aware of what you're doing they know they need to kill it they will happily spend removal to get it out of there once you've gotten a ton of counters on it and it doesn't do quite as much if we were a dedicated dice rolling deck, I think this would be an auto include, but after testing it a few times, I don't think it quite does as much as we want it to be doing. All right. Now that does bring us to the actual end of the deck tech. The last thing we're going to have to do is actually test this deck out in a game. So we're going to run this deck up against three separate opponents this week. And this week we are joined by Sean playing his Sliver Overlord deck, Bilal playing Jared Carthalian, and Jason playing Sakashima of a Thousand Faces and Tana the Bloodsower. So starting off with Sean, his Sliver Overlord deck is exactly what it looks like. It is a Sliver Tribal deck. He wants to have a ton of Slivers, start attacking his opponents, make sure that they're all pumping each other up, tutor out the best Sliver for the situation, make sure that nothing can kill him, and just kind of steamroll his opponents. I think that knowing what I know about all of these decks, I do think the Sliver deck is the one that I am the most afraid of because we could have a ton of little tokens, we could have a ton of elementals, or we could have a ton of insects or whatever. Slivers don't really care. They'll have Trample, they'll have Lifelink, they'll have Death Touch, Indestructible, Unblockable, Flying, whatever it might be. So I am very concerned about what Slivers can do considering we're not going to have a ton of blockers. Next up, we do have Bilal's Jared Carthalian deck, which he mentioned is mostly the pre-con that this came with. However, he has made some upgrades to it on his own as well. This is just kind of five-color good stuff. He just wants to play as many multicolored cards as possible, just put a ton of counters on things, make sure that all of his stuff gets incredibly big, and kind of flood the board with massive creatures. So I would assume that that is a deck to watch out for, but because I don't know too much about it, it's hard for me to say exactly what's concerning with the deck. And then finally, Jason's Tana and Sakashima deck. This is a token deck that wants to play all the big creatures that make tokens like Rampaging Baloths or Avenger of Zendikar, and then it wants to copy those so that way there's always more tokens, there's always more things that are being copied, and there's just a never-ending supply of tokens because Sakashima is going to be the one copying the tokens, Tana is going to be the one making the tokens, and hopefully the two combined are just going to flood the board. Now, I think overall this is probably the deck that we are best equipped to handle because we are going to be making a solid amount of like 2-2s and 1-1s, and while they're not great blockers, they can usually do a pretty good job of stopping the 1-1s that Tana might be making. But if Jason does make copies of some of his bigger creatures, then I think we're going to start to worry a bit. So those are our opponents for this week. That is our deck tech, and I hope you all enjoyed it, and I will talk to you all once the game is done. At the start of the game, Sean goes first, followed by myself, Bilal, and then Jason. On Sean's first turn, he plays a Savage Lands. I play an Island. Bilal plays a Smoldering Marsh. Jason plays a Stomping Ground Tapped. Sean plays a Mutavolt and then casts Rampant Growth, searching his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. I play a Forest. Bilal plays a Forest and then casts Farseek, searching his library for scattered groves, putting it into play tapped. Jason plays an Island. 
Sean plays a forest and casts Pillar of Origins, naming Slivers so that it taps for a mana of any color, but only to cast Slivers, and then casts Siphon Sliver, giving all his Slivers lifelink. I play an island and then cast Fabricate, searching my library for an artifact and putting it into my hand. This lets me get Storm Cauldron. Bilal plays a mountain and casts Harrow, sacrificing the mountain he just played to search his library for two basic lands, putting them into play. Once that is resolved, he casts Baleful Strix, drawing a card. Unfortunately, Jason misses his third land drop and passes. Sean casts Thorncaster Sliver, making each of his slivers do one damage to any target whenever they attack. Then he attacks me for two, doing an extra one to me on attacks while Sean gains three life. I play a forest and then cast Sakura Tribe Elder. Bilal plays a Glacial Fortress and casts Timeless Lotus. Jason unfortunately misses his land drop again and passes. Sean casts Sliver Hivelord, giving all his slivers indestructible. He then moves to combat and attacks me for 4, doing an additional 2 damage to me on attacks. Then I block with the Elder and sacrifice it before damage to search my library for a basic land and put it into play. This results in me taking a total of 4 damage, while Sean gains 4 life. On my turn I cast Zendikar's Royal, letting me make a 2-2 elemental token whenever a land enters the battlefield under my control. Then I immediately play an island, making an elemental. Bilal plays a Prairie Stream and casts Chulain Teller of Tales, letting him draw a card and put a land into play whenever he casts a creature. Then he casts Rith the Awakener, triggering Chulain so he draws a card, but doesn't have a land to put into play. On Jason's turn he casts Resculpt, exiling Chulain and making Bilal a 4-4 elemental token. Sean plays a Dream Root Cascade and casts Swiftfoot Boots. He goes to equip Swiftfoot Boots to Sliver Hivelord, but Bilal responds, casting Swords to Plowshares to exile the Hivelord. Determined to keep his Sliver, Sean casts Counterspell to counter the Swords to Plowshares. Then the Boots become equipped, and Sliver Hivelord gains Haste and Hexproof. He then moves to Combat, attacking Jason for 5 and Bilal for 4, doing an extra damage to Jason and an extra 2 damage to Bilal. Bilal then blocks with Rith and his Elemental, taking no damage, while Jason takes the 5 and Sean gains 12 total life. On my turn I play a Forest, making another Elemental token, and then cast Titan of Industry, making a 4-4 Rhino token and destroying Sean's Swiftfoot boots. I then move to Combat and attack Sean for 2. Bilal casts Ramos Dragon Engine, which gets a plus one plus one counter on it for each color of mana in any spell that Bilal casts. He then casts his commander, Jared Carthalian, putting five counters on Ramos. He activates Jared's minus three ability, putting three plus one plus one counters on Rith and two on the Baleful Strix. He then moves to combat, attacking Sean for 12, removing five counters from Ramos when his creatures do damage to make 10 mana. He uses this mana to activate Rith's ability, making eight Saperling tokens since there are eight green permanents in play. On Jason's turn, he unfortunately still can't find a third land, so he passes. Sean plays a Steam Vents tapped, and then attacks Bilal with all of his slivers, doing three damage to him on attacks. Bilal then blocks with three Saperlings, taking no damage, while Sean gains 12 life. Then in his second main phase, Sean casts his commander, Sliver Overlord, letting him pay three mana to search his library for a sliver and put it into his hand, or gain control of target sliver. On my turn, I play a forest, making another elemental, and then cast Skyship Weatherlight, searching my library for a Risen Reef and exiling it. This allows me to pay four mana to put the exiled card into my hand. Bilal plays a Murmuring Bosk, and then activates Jared's plus one ability to create a 3-3 Kavu token with Trample that's all colors. He moves to combat, attacking Sean with his entire board of creatures, and Sean blocks four damage, killing Bilal's elemental token and taking 21 damage. Then Bilal activates Rith, making 16 Saperling tokens since there are 16 green permanents in play. On Jason's turn, he casts three visits, searching his library for a Ketria Triome and putting it into play tapped. Sean activates Sliver Hivelord's ability, searching his library for Cloud Shredder Sliver, putting it into his hand, and then casting it, giving all of his slivers haste and flying. This allows Sean to attack Bilal with everything he's got for 22 total damage, doing an additional 5 on attacks and gaining a total of 22 life. At the end of turn, I then activate the Skyship Weatherlight to put Risen Reef into my hand. 
On my turn, I cast the Risen Reef, letting me look at the top card of my library whenever an elemental enters the battlefield and put it into play if it's a land or into my hand if it's not. With this trigger, I put the card into my hand. Then I play an island, creating an elemental, which triggers Risen Reef, putting an island into play, which creates another elemental, triggering Risen Reef again, but this time I just put the card into my hand. After that, I cast Storm Cauldron, letting each player play an additional land each turn, but returning any land to its owner's hand when it's tapped for mana. This lets me play Guildless Commons, returning an island to my hand. This makes me another elemental token, triggers Risen Reef, but again, I just put the card into my hand. Bilal activates Jared's minus 3 ability, killing the Planeswalker, putting 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on his Kavu token, and 3 on Rith. He then recasts Jared, putting 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Ramos, and returning a Plains and Glacial Fortress to his hand. This allows him to activate Jared's minus 3 ability again, putting 5 more counters on the Kavu, and 3 more counters on Rith. He then replays the Plains and the Glacial Fortress, and cycles a Canyon Slough, returning the Plains and Glacial Fortress to his hand again. He moves to combat, attacking Sean with his entire board for 61 damage, knocking Sean out of the game. Also on damage, Bilal activates Rith, returning 3 lands to his hand and making 34 sapperling tokens since there are 34 green permanents in play. On Jason's turn, he's unable to find a 4th land, so he decides to concede rather than get run over by sapperlings on Bilal's next turn. On my turn, I cast Azuri's Predation, returning 8 lands to hand, creating a 4-4 beast token for each of Bilal's creatures, which is 63 beasts, and then each beast fights one of his creatures. Bilal attempts to find a response, making 10 mana with Ramos and casting Sultide Charm to draw 2 cards and discard a card, but he's unable to find an answer, so the spell resolves. This kills all his sapperlings and clears the way so I can attack him with my elementals, hitting him for 24 damage, winning me the game. All right, so that was a sweet game. We didn't quite get to see the full power of Storm Cauldron, but that's mainly because Bilal and Sean just really had it out for each other. They were just going real hard the whole time, kind of smacking into each other with all these big creatures, and we kind of got lucky that we got ignored for the most part until we got to the end, and that massive Azuri's Predation made us like 60-something beasts, and we were able to just kind of run Bilal over at the end. Jason, unfortunately could not find lands to save his life, so we really didn't get to see much from Tana and from Sakashima, but hopefully next time. And then the two five-color decks, I mean, there's not much to say. They did exactly what they wanted to do. They made a ton of creatures, did a ton of damage, and we were just kind of lucky with the fact that we were there to pick up the pieces once those two stopped fighting. So a super sweet deck. It was nice to see the deck win, even though we didn't get to use the combo, but... Maybe next time we'll see it go off. So if you have any suggestions for cards that could improve the deck, if you have any suggestions for cards you want to see made into a deck, please do leave them in the comments. And as always, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will talk to you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.